All right. Well, Gabe, we got an exciting episode today. Uh, really looking forward to it. Yeah, we do. Um, we've got Allison Short on on our show today, and I, I guess our our people finally got in touch with her people, and <laughs> um, we we made it work. So, but great conversation. It is going to be so neat. Yeah, I think I think her her journey is definitely one that's inspiring um, and and insightful, educational as as well. Mm. And uh, she's. She very much wears her heart on her sleeve and 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 uh, is willing to kind of dig in and and share the share the journey and the bumps along the way. So uh, yeah, great, and great I, I think I, I think there's a lot that our listeners will be able to really get from this this episode. Allison drops some really great um, hints and uh, tips and tricks on career development, on uh, mentoring, and finding that community that can really help you as a safety professional. So a uh, really, really great interview. And she's such a joy to talk with. She is. She's, she's as much Canadian as you can get without actually being Canadian. So. <laughs> awesome. awesome. I'm Scott Cuthbert, co-founder of Safepedia. And I am Gabe Incarnachan, president of BBL Safety. And uh, we're super happy. I think this is... I've lost track of total episodes, but episode two for 2024 for uh, Safeonomics. And uh, we had to move mountains to get uh, Allison Short as our as our guest today. But uh, we're, we feel very, very fortunate and uh, and very excited about uh, about our uh, conversation today. Just just little mountains. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> Glad to exactly. be here, y'all. Yeah. Fantastic. Gabe, I didn't know if you were going to give Allison an introduction or if she needs no introduction or uh oh no we'll we'll uh we'll give a little bit of detail definitely at the at the intro but um I mean Allison uh oh let, let, let's do a fun different introduction here just because oh. it's it's Friday when we're recording this so Allison how would you describe yourself in three words oh goodness um let's see <laughs> What a, oh what a what a challenge there, Gabe. Um, <laughs> how would you describe me in three words? Is that oh, no, better? No, there's no tag backs. No tag, no backs. tag backs. Okay. Um, let's see. I am. Oh my gosh, I'm just blanking. <laughs> there's some good words out there. Let's see. People like enigmatic. That's an exciting SAT word. Wow. Um, okay, that's a, um, nice. Let's see ambitious we'll, we'll put that one out there perfect um and i don't know fun let's say fun that's perfect so enigmatic ambitious and fun that's awesome okay hey good good job on that one so i mean the reason why i'm bringing that up too there is an actual purpose to that it's not just me <laughs> challenging me on a friday <laughs> i know right <laughs> Exactly. So, okay, what we're what we're focusing on this year, Scott and I are on on Safeonomics, is looking at it professionals in the safety field who are inspired and motivated, mm -hmm. and ones that will bring additional value not just for their own careers but even for the profession as as a whole. And I know that you've had a lot of experience being involved in different associations. You really, uh, for someone who has not. Uh, let's say, grown up in the safety profession, like myself, uh, you've, I mean, I didn't grow up in the safety profession either, but you've really leaned into it so much and been inspired and have inspired others to do the same. So just to, to open it up as well, I mean, what, what keeps you moving in, in this profession? What keeps you going? Mm, yeah, that's a beautiful intro. Um, I think the, it is that drive to kind of keep pushing forward and keep giving people opportunities that I've been given. Um, I think you kind of reach this tipping point every, I don't know if it's every decade or what, whatever it is, but you know, I'm, I'm hitting that decade of time and mm. it's starting to kind of feel full circle. Um, so it's, I'm getting to have some of these opportunities that I thought, oh my gosh, if I could just one day get to be on a podcast or get to 
speak in front of this kind of a group or get this training opportunity or be, be friends, be in, be in a photograph with all the women in safety excellence advisory Mm. committee, you know, like that, for whatever reason, that's an example that is something that I looked up towards a long time ago. Um, and now I'm on that committee. How cool is that? You know, so it's kind of like, getting that feeling and now getting to this point and having those opportunities where people say, Oh, Allison, you're so inspiring. I'm going, wait, wait a minute. We, <laughs> I just got here, you know? And so it's so fun to get to have a couple of opportunities now where I get to bring people up, not necessarily that they're younger than me, but that they're newer in the profession or they wanting to get more involved. And so it's been so fun to kind of create those opportunities and really just encourage other people and other women specifically uh, is, is one of the things I love about this work. That's super cool. So how did you, you kind of touched on it, but how did, how did you get into the safety profession and what was the, uh, what was the, the most the indirect way possible. <laughs> uh, you know, now more and more, there's people that went to school for this. And I'm like, this is fascinating. Tell me how you found out about this job, because I had no idea. Um, so I, I'm actually, I have a fine arts degree. Um, I went to school to study dance and thought I was going to be a dance educator. So I was certified to teach in my state for a while. Um, and then went to student teach and thought, oh, no, 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 I do not want to go to high school every day and do this. (laughs) And so I got a job at a company in my hometown just to make some money, have something to do. And my first mentor at that company said, hey, why don't you come and work in safety with me? And I was like, great. I hate the data entry I'm doing. Worth a shot. Uh, and he was an excellent mentor and really kind of set up a pathway that was clear to continue uh, even after he left the organization. And so I've just continued to do that. Uh, and now it's been almost 10 years and I really love the work uh, and I'm still in it. And I've done a lot of self-education and mentorship mm. from other people in the, in the industry. Uh, so I think that's why that component is so important to me. That's amazing. I it I mean it takes a lot of initiative, I guess, to be able to not just exist in the profession and to do the job, but to actually take those extra steps, as you said, to teach yourself on it and to to grow in in that beyond just the the confines of the job itself. So uh, one of the things that I've kind of been curious about too, and I don't know if I if I've ever brought this up with you, Allison, but the this idea of of being part of an organization like like ASSP and getting involved in the local chapters and then getting involved in other groups um, with that were you were you doing that as a way to to grow your grow yourself professionally was it a way to add another layer to to your work give it some some purpose some meaning some context or is it a combination of those like why did you pursue that Yeah. So in 2016, I went to ASSP for the first time because it was Mm -hmm. in Atlanta. So the company was like, sure, we don't have to fly you. We'll let you go to that. Um, And so I, I didn't really know anything about it. I actually went with my dad, which is a really fun fact uh, because he also does like ISO auditing and safety consulting. Um, And so I knew a little bit about the industry, more kind of environmental, but Um, so it was fun to kind of join the family, uh, industry a little bit That's cool. and, um, yeah, so super cool. And so I, I didn't really know anything about it though, that it is like drinking out of a fire hose when you join this industry. I am not a person that historically loved science. I'm not a person that studied a lot of math. Um, and so, and really was a person who said, I will never be in an office. I will never, I am an artist first. I will do art and and get to be creative at all times. Um, and so it's, it's very interesting. I have to redirect my mind sometimes to go, Oh wait, no, I like STEM. This is cool (laughs) (laughs) because it's just so different from how I kind of grew up. And so when I got to ASSP, I, I saw that there was this thing called wise. I was like, wait a minute there's women that do this. This is cool. I it's was very, very male populated in the industry that the company that I worked for, um, all of my initial first 
seven years was really, really, really male populated. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of thought, oh, can I find some women that maybe know how to do this job? That would be nice. And, um, uh, and I went and I didn't really meet a ton of people. It was, it was overwhelming. There were so mm -hmm. many people there. Um, and so I just got a contact that said, Hey, send us an email. We'll get you set up with chapter wise, which is kind of the local divisions of, okay. um, women in safety excellence. And, that email turned into, Hey, Allison, thank you for joining the steering committee. We'd love to have you set up <laughs> Georgia wise. It's like, um, what? I don't even know what this is. How am I voluntold. suddenly yeah, working here? <laughs> um, it was the best voluntold experience ever because I, I now have three women who live in my state who have become incredible mentors and friends mm. to me. Um, and so I think really, I just started in the ASSP because I said, some there's got to be somebody that's like me there has mm -hmm. to be someone out there that i can learn from and feel comfortable with uh and have that has some similar experiences that i've had but then also some people that have way more experience than me that i can learn from right. uh, and so i think that's that's kind of where i started and then that continued community and collaboration and mentorship is why i'm still here hmm. that's amazing yeah that's and so just kind of going back to the beginning when you first first sort of stepped foot into the into the safety world um and we we get the you know questions all the time i think um it's changing like you mentioned there's 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 formal programs you can get into right out of right out of high school um but there's a lot of folks who who found themselves in safety that didn't necessarily initially set out to be uh to be in in safety Right. So what, like kind of reflecting on those, those past 10 years, um, just sort of as, you know, sort of courses or programs or designations, like what, what, what advice would you give somebody who, who might be that first step or two into safety, wondering, you know, what to do? And so what, what worked? And then maybe kind of what, what were some things that if you could go back, you know, not, no, no regrets, but maybe yeah. you would, you would do a little bit differently. Yeah, yeah, no regrets. Love it. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, I think, I, I did a lot of training at my local um, OSHA training institute. So, I think it is helpful to look up that OTI, um, the one in Georgia is at Georgia Tech, and it's excellent and amazing. Um, and so I did two cert certification programs through them, uh, just professional certificate programs. And that was a great basis of knowledge, but then also good networking as well. Mm. So I, I was able to kind of network, talk to people, um, all those little edges of time. That's what I tell a lot of people that are new to any industry. It doesn't have to be safety. Um, get to the meeting a little early, which I'm really not good at. But if you if you can't get there early, <laughs> get there a little early, um, stay a little late. That's my personal sweet spot where all those little edges of time where you can kind of somebody that talked in the meeting that you thought, Oh, that person sounds cool. Or they had an interesting tidbit to share. I want to go talk to them. Um, those little edges of time that aren't designated are really fruitful for networking mm. and putting yourself out there in, in a little bit more comfortable way. Uh, so I think that's, that's definitely an encouragement to do that. Um, I went to a lot of the ASSP meetings, uh, and so at my local chapter, and that again, networking, some new information. Um, I think biggest advice would just kind of be to take in the information that you can, because there's no way you can can actually contain and and learn and be able to apply all of it. Mm. Um, and I think I at the time tried to do a lot of that because I thought that was what was required of me. Um, and, and again, I was young. I looked like I was 15. Maybe I still look like I'm 15 <laughs> for some of these people <laughs> that I was trying to trade in safety. And they, they were like, who are you? Why are you talking to us about log out, tag out, get out of here. Uh, and so I think the, the encouragement to just be yourself in the work mm -hmm. is something that, um, I'm still learning, I think, and still leaning into more and more every day. And so I think that is something that I don't know if I could have heard it and, mm. and taken that advice 10 years ago, but I think that's something that, um, that I probably would have, would have done differently. 
Uh, and then, you know, I did, I also did the ASSP or excuse me, ASP and CSP certifications, uh, because my mentor said that's kind of, that's the gold standard. That's the way to get there. Mm. I will say the caveat is I was at a company that paid for that, uh, and gave me the time to go do all of these training classes. Uh, and so that it's significant. That's a lot of money and time. And I had a bachelor's degree that allowed me to do that programming as mm. well. So, um, you know, it, it's, that was my path. It doesn't have to be the only path. Hmm. So I wanted to touch on something a little bit that, that you had uh, brought up a couple times and, and Scott and I've had this, this discussion about the role that community plays for the, the safety professional and in the safety profession as a whole, it feels like there's kind of this, this weird kind of dichotomy that happens where there, there are groups where people are, are forming community they are they're connecting with one another and at the same time you have a lot of lone wolves that are that are out there yeah. so people that are in the safety profession they are in a lot of ways looking for that community but might not necessarily be in a place where they would actually be able to do that and i think especially after after covid and as people started working remotely more finding that community and that connection probably became a lot more difficult have you experienced that? And then what have you done to still build that community? What, how, how does someone do that kind of in this day and age? Yeah. I think a lot of our virtual platforms uh, have helped. Uh, COVID, you know, the good part of COVID, I guess, the good result is that we have a lot more virtual opportunities, Safepedia, right? I'm not, you know, I'm talking to the the people that made uh, virtual safety conferences a thing, uh, and so I think that was an excellent way to be able to convince your organization that hey, I can come do this entire huge training and get this community building as a part of it uh, without having to pay for planes and hotels and food and all the other things that happen. Um, but I also you know, be a little creative, right? So the, I think you can advocate for your networking and for your training. Um, look for those local programming that, that you think is interesting um, and sell your company on that. It, it's a lunch break, you know, I, I'm not gonna work anyway. So really I'm going to work to network and learn um, and and kind of try to create a little bit of, um, of job crafting around those networking opportunities um, as much as you can, which I've I've done every company that I've been at uh, probably to to the max. You know, <laughs> I always tell people like, "Hey, you're gonna have to tell me that I can't do networking because I will say yes to all of it." Uh, <laughs> so um, I think that you know, getting getting that that return on investment and clarifying that ability um to to advocate for yourself hmm. yeah and you you mentioned um i mean creativity i think at the beginning being a, a creative person and then e even uh mm -hmm. just in, in your last uh response there so how does like I, again i think a, a lot of times it's it's compliance and it's following uh technical or legislative guidelines how can you, how do you bring creativity into, into what you do? Yeah, I, that's a good question. Cause it doesn't, it doesn't look like it's very creative on paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, sometimes I struggle with that. I will say joining this industry was very hard for me um, because it was so different from what I thought my thought, quote unquote, my life was going to look like. Mm. Um, for, for me, I think that like I was saying before, like leaning more and more into being myself at work is really powerful um, and allows me to use some of those creative skills. Like the way that I that I talk to a group of of my policyholders when I go visit them and the way I do training is sometimes very different from my coworkers and colleagues. Um, I am I'm going to make a fool of myself when I'm doing ergonomics training. Like I literally, <laughs> I was demonstrating how we stay in the same posture all day. Uh, you know, I was like, all right, you're at your computer and then you go get in your car. And I, you know, demonstrating really a, over the top physically, um, to let people know, Hey, this is, this is what we do with our bodies. Let's think about how we can change our posture. Um, and so I kind of like, I'm willing to 
be kind of goofy or be funny in a training in a way that um, engages the people in the room because I am aware that I look maybe different than what they expected when they heard a safety person was going to come talk to them. Uh, and so I can kind of combat their expectations by, again, shifting what they expect uh, in mm. a little bit more creative way as well. Uh, so it's it's fun. I, I'm continuing to kind of develop and hone that a little bit more as I keep doing it. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's I, I had the same question too, because it's, it's that idea that, um, let, let's say, especially with, with regulations or, or standards, you don't necessarily want someone that's really creative messing around with those kind of things. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. <laughs> you know, it's like, you don't want a creative accountant. You know, it's, yeah, it's probably yeah. not a good thing to have. <laughs> uh, but, but there are ways to bring that level of creativity, uh, authenticity, and, and bring, as, as we've talked about in the past, about bringing your whole self to, yeah. to work. And being able to to build that uh, that value for not just for yourself but even for the others that you're you're working with, I think that that's a, there are fun ways to do it, absolutely, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to all be just drudgery and <laughs> right, yeah. But I think it, you know, like meeting people where they are as well, like that's hmm. something that maybe it doesn't maybe create it, creativity is not the right word, but I think a lot of a lot of artists are are very aware of like what is happening in the room right now and what what do i have to work with mm. and how can i use use these tools use these skills and like adjust them in a way that's going to be functional um and so i all the time i think about that same original mentor that i had steve Ballou. he he'd said from the very beginning he was like do not become a safety person that is solely focused on the standard over anything else um mm. and you're and you're having people do safety tasks that are completely unnecessary, aren't functional, are counterproductive, um, just to say that you're doing them. And so I think about that pretty often because I want to be a safety person that's doing, that has functional recommendations, that's involving all the people in the room. Mm. Uh, and so, and, and often maybe the people who don't feel like they're heard as well. That's really important to me mm. is kind of including those folks that, um, that know the work the best and, are often ignored. Um, so I think, you know, we, you hear that pretty often in safety, but I think that it is continually important to kind of follow up, reach out, talk to the people that are actually doing the work. That's a, that's a great point. And I, I think that, um, again, <clears throat> I think that's, that's been discussed a lot over the years. And, um, how do you, how do you balance like when, cause and and things are ch changing. I think industry is getting a little bit more supportive of of the safety folks within their organizations. I think you know COVID helped yep. um, kind of uh, bring some focus to how, how important uh, the the role is and and how how much uh, support you should be providing to the safety folks within your organization. But there's still we hear a lot of like I'm I, you know I'm treading water. I'm overwhelmed. I'm overworked. And and so when you're just trying to keep up with you know reporting and and uh, uh, you know compliance legislation, how do you how do you set aside that time? How do you make sure to set aside that time to to listen to those people like you said that that aren't haven't traditionally been been uh, been heard in the in the yeah. past? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I. I used the term job crafting a minute ago, and that's kind of um, something that I've been learning and studying it here recently with my um, graduate program that I'm in, which is organizational psychology. And the idea of job crafting is you you take the the things that you enjoy, the parts of your job that um, that give you a little bit more bandwidth, that uh, that'll fill your cup more uh, and try to create your work day or your work week in such a way that, that there's more of that happening. It doesn't mean you don't fill out your reports and you don't do your OSHA logs and all those things that have to happen. Um, but you set up your day in such a way that, uh, that you're, you can do those other less, uh, glamorous or less, um, attractive to you as a person doing the job, uh, at a time that works. Uh, so I, I catch myself, I work from home often when I'm doing just like my normal desk work. Um, and so I can tell if I have been 
at home for three days straight and I haven't talked to a, a, a client. Uh, I haven't done any networking. I haven't podcasted that week, right? If I haven't done something that that I enjoy, I can, I literally physically can feel in my body, this kind of tension, um, the job tasks that I have to do that I don't like as much feel that much more annoying and, and burdensome. Um, and so anytime I feel that way, I kind of go, okay, Allison, schedule a visit, like get out there, get on the road, go see somebody because that's, what's filling you up. Um, and you haven't done that in three days and the weekend prior, you know, mm. you kind of go, Oh wait, there's been, there's been five days in a row that you haven't actually talked to people that are doing work. And so you, you kind of realize that's where I get my energy to keep doing this job. Well, let's get out there and talk to those mm. people again. Um, so I think that reminder, uh, that kind of constant, Hey, what, what is good? What's exciting? Uh, maybe, you have, maybe you do that at the beginning of the day. I don't necessarily always believe do the worst task first <laughs> that because <laughs> you can just keep delaying that. Right. Um, well, suddenly I have to make coffee 12 times. Um, so do the task that will give you some joy and bandwidth mm. to then finish the rest of those unfortunate um, or less exciting tasks. <laughs> My boss will love me talking about all yeah. of this if she listens. <laughs> I'll do the boring task too. Don't worry. <laughs> That's so great though. I mean, that what a what a fantastic approach to that as well. I, I love that idea of understanding what it is that brings you joy in what you're doing. And, and Scott and I have had these discussions as well of looking at why do some people burn out in their jobs? Yeah. Um, we, we talk about safety professionals, which are really, that that's a whole other animal because it, it can be a very emotionally and physically draining job. Uh, just the, the types of things that, that we have to work with and deal with, it's, it is very, very difficult. And at the same time, there are some very fulfilling parts of it. I think that those pieces can get drowned out by the, the, the monotony or the drudgery or the, the emotional weight yeah. of of what we're trying to do. So to have that concept of reminding yourself, okay, here's the, here's why I, I like doing this. Here's what mm -hmm. I'm, what I'm passionate about. Um, maybe it's not even related to that job specifically, but it's something you can bring to the safety profession uh, right. that will, that will, as you said, kind of fill your cup. And, uh, and instead of just getting locked in on the things that are just always draining you over and over. Right. Um, and get I, in that, I recognize way. that routine too, right? Like the, is, and is it, what's the routine? And also, is this actually an expectation? Like do, do your supervisors, does your company actually have these expectations for you? Or are you just continuing to do this work and this task because we quote unquote, we've always done it this way. Um, and, and it's not actually providing any value. Uh, so <laughs> it's a good reminder to evaluate what is your work? What is your work? And does it all need to be done the way that you're currently doing it? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good, <clears throat> it's a good point. As you were describing how to organize, it's like I, administrative things are, are always like a, a, something that I push off and, and they, they hang over you. But then once <laughs> you jump in and start doing it, it's like, it's kind of rewarding because it's very yeah. measurable, right? Like, but, but it has to be. Um, at, a, at a time and a place where you're ready to, uh, you know, to to take on those those tasks versus, you know, when you when you I think most safety folks are are people people right and right. and they want to have those interactions and those those discussions and and so uh, I think I think that's a great advice to kind of map that out on a on a weekly you know biweekly basis and work it into your into your schedule so yeah. You, you mentioned <clears throat> mentors, and and I think this is a, a say a hot topic. It's it's talked about an awful lot, but I think that, and this could just be me, <laughs> but I think I think the impression is is that you your mentor is like the the Buddhist monk who's like sits up on the top of the mountain and <laughs> meditates and and has has been around for a thousand years and knows everything. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I, but I heard somebody once, you know, say you sh you should have some, a mentor who is, you know, in a in a position that you aspire to be in, mm -hmm. but you should also have a mentor that's that's where you were in the past, 
Yeah. And and so that you 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 see it's kind of like um, you know seeing things through your children's eyes, you know, and and seeing them differently than maybe you did, but also having somebody with some experience to kind of guide you when you when you get out of uh, out of out of that experience or comfort zone that you're in. Yeah. What 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 advice would you have? You you talked about mentors as far as people yeah. find you to have to be formal, you know. Right. Like, yeah. Or, I think you know. <laughs> The, the formal mentors are fabulous. I've, I've also, I, I laughed when you said that about the the perfect, I, I was just imagining my other <laughs> mentor, Linnea Miles, like in that Buddhist uh, pose, you know, so um, I, I love that. Um, formal mentorship is fabulous. I also think that it is, it is, seems very difficult to achieve if mm. you don't have a clear avenue on how to get to that point. Um, if you didn't go to school for this, you don't have a, a professor that you can reach out to that has been in that very clear chain of mentorship. Um, especially if you're a new person that's coming into this industry and you already feel overwhelmed, you're like, oh my gosh, I have to get a mentor too? What? How? Like, <laughs> how am I supposed to do this? <laughs> it, it feels like a lot. And there's there's all these people that talk about mentors. So it just becomes this like holier than thou kind of pathway to figuring out life. And it's great to have that formal program. And, and when you can get that avenue, excellent, go after it. Um, but I have certainly used mentor. I, it doesn't, ha you don't have to call them a mentor. The people that you interact with that are doing the jobs that you want to be doing, they're your mentors. Maybe they don't even know it. Uh, I have a plenty of people that I watch their work. I watch how they interact with people on LinkedIn. Um, I look at the language that they're using. I'm reading the articles that they share and you're like, oh, that's fascinating. I should be doing that. Or I should read that. Why, why does your brain think that way? Mm. Um, and you can reach out and have a conversation with them. Um, there's, there's a lot more ability to have people mentor you than than we really talk about. And so I think it it doesn't have to be formal. It can be so informal that even a person you've never met can be your mentor. Um, right. and, and you're missing some of that collaborative piece. Like I understand that you need that back and forth rapport as well. Um, but I don't know, all the time I just encourage people to steal from others and and follow, really pay attention and follow along um, with other people that you're intrigued or interested or want to get to that point as well. Um, That's cool. I like that you brought up that, that um, informal and almost one-way mentoring. I mean, I, yeah. I know you're a big reader. Yep. So that's reading is definitely a great way to, to get that almost uh, very one way <laughs> Mentoring. Right. It's not like you can talk to the author right then. Yeah. But um Yeah, Adam Grant's an excellent mentor of yeah, mine of mine. I, he doesn't I, know. But I love telling people that Adam Grant and Brene Brown are, are yes. they're my mentors. Exactly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah but yeah. you can I mean but you can use those skills like when you are re receiving that information on that one-way street like I am using some of that verbiage when I go talk to people mm. when I'm doing my actual job um like the I just I keep talking about it but like Adam Grant just had a, a research study where he said hey I'm going to if I tell a person I care about you. And so I'm going to give you feedback because I have the expectation that you will receive it and follow through with this feedback. That is, and it's like 90%, I don't know what the actual percentage is, but like some percentage that doesn't matter because they don't mean anything anyways. <laughs> like they're clearly that, that setup for giving people critical feedback mm. works. And they're so much more likely to receive that information. I, Adam didn't call me personally to say, hey, Allison, I think that you should use this language when you talk to your <laughs> clients because they'll be more likely to listen to you. But I can take that language and use it when I talk to my clients, maybe not ex explicitly those exact words, but that kind of language um, is is working for me. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it's cool to be able to use stuff and and be willing to just use something, try it. Try it a couple times. If it doesn't work, chop it, throw it away, try something else. I feel like that's so much what what this profession is about as well, where it's th there are certain areas that are are kind of uncharted. Uh, you know, we're we haven't even really 
touched on, or I'm not sure if we have the time to touch on the the role of technology in this in safety profession, and that's continuing to evolve and grow. Uh, but it, there is a lot of of figuring out the stuff that still needs to happen. I, I feel like that's where the the mentorship, the community, the networking, that's where the, this all comes into play because we're not we're not on an island here. There are other people that are doing this stuff. And the, the first thing that comes to mind for me is whenever I run into a problem or a question, I think someone has to have figured this out before. Right. I, I can't be the first person that's ever thought of this. And so it's it's great to have people to be able to bounce ideas off of and, and check in with to be able to build that. And so I think it makes you actually that much more valuable in your work. You find the work more fulfilling. And sure. there's something just really exciting about that sense of discovery and especially when you get to discover with other people and everybody learns something out of it. Right. Yeah. And that po- like to your point when someone else can give you uh, something that's worked for them, they're like, oh, yeah. yeah, you know, it's such a good <laughs> feeling to be able to share something that's been successful for you. You're just like, please someone ask me about this because it was so great. I want to share it. Mm. Uh you know, so I like that's what's so great about this organization I work for now, Mimic. There's 40 of us that are safety consultants and they're all brilliant. And so it's like I'm spread out. I am on an island, but I can reach out to every single one of them at any time and say, "Hey, what do you think about this? Has anybody done this?" And um as you said, the the feedback is immediate. Anybody that has an experience that has something that's worked well, they're like, hey, Allison, let, what about this? Try this. Um, and then let me know if it works too. Yeah. Well, we're, the um, uh, question I have, so we, we you know, I'll start over, sorry, but my, if, you, if, you're, if you're my vintage, you were, you were probably voluntold to be the safety person on the on the job site I would say sure. construction yep. and and so it was sort of like you once you once you get on that path you're riding that path you know to the end of your career and you're going to be <clears throat> you know maybe the 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 manager maybe the director maybe even the VP but you're going to be <clears throat> in that traditional uh safety professional role and uh and you know, kind of weaving in a little bit about, you know, be yourself and, and be creative and, and explore. Um, there, there are a lot of, uh, when, you know, when we started Safepedia we, in building the community, we realized there's a lot of different avenues that safety professionals can can go. And and you, you talked about um, your experience in consulting and having peers. Uh, why don't you, why don't you shed a little light on, on what you do, you know, and, and how, how you kind of found found your current current role? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I I started working for a massive utility company in the southeast, uh, which is its own animal, right? Uh, and so I did that for I don't know seven or eight years. Worked for Auburn University for the past two years, uh, which is really a fun and in, very different, interesting challenge. Um, with a lot of interesting science and agriculture, a lot of veterinary animal safety that I had no idea I would wow. learn anything about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like this is it's wild, um, literally wild. Um, and then and then now I work for Mimic, which is a monoline workers' compensation carrier, uh, based in Portland, Maine. Uh, and so it's it is all of those roles kind of combined. So I, I'm a consultant for our policyholders and our prospective policyholders. And so I do a lot of onboarding and initial visits. And then once we have a policy, I get to kind of help them and, and collaborate and partner with them, mm-hmm. which is really, really cool. Um, a kind of interesting different angle than the safety that I had done previously, obviously using a lot of those same skills, but doing some different consultative sales skills as well. Uh, so it's been a really fun kind of interesting challenge. And I still get to work with every industry that exists out there, which is really cool as well. Um, so I've, I've been enjoying it. I've been there officially a year now. Uh, so it's uh, it feels a little bit like home. We're getting there. <laughs> so it's it's cool. It's It's been interesting to kind of shift into consulting and get to do some more of that job crafting and and have a little bit of ownership of the work that I'm doing, which is really cool. Cool. Well, it's, it's been a pleasure to, to have you. I think 
covered a lot of interesting topics, lots of great advice. Totally. Um, again, maybe maybe just in in closing, is there any kind of final uh, you know words words of wisdom you know for 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 folks out there that might might be you know struggling, questioning their career decision, you know, wondering <laughs> yeah. wondering what's next. Yeah, well, I I, I think um, you are not the first person to question joining this career, um, and you'll probably question it again. <laughs> you'll probably do it uh, again, think, maybe you know, tomorrow, <laughs> <laughs> maybe two days from now. Uh, I it is there is it is a it's a stressful job, and mm. and depending on how your organization is set up or the role that you have, you may feel like a lot of that is on you personally to feel like you need to fix or change. Um, especially if you're in an organization with a difficult culture, that's very hard. Um, so I think one that's, it's acceptable, feel those feelings. Um, and then, then take some time to figure out what does work look like? What's the best, what's the best version of a work day that I can come up with? Um, and is, and, and can I make that happen at my current role? Um, or if I can't maybe try to set up some steps to be able to shift into something else. Um, but I, you know, I think just give yourself some grace and maybe go do a workout. Um, <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then, and then see if you can, if you can check back in and engage and, um, and reach out to your reach out, um, let people know that, that you're having a hard time. I think more and more, um, it is so rewarding to have colleagues and friends that, that you can say, Hey, like <laughs> I am, I'm having one of those days and it's a lot right now. Um, and you know, I mean, Gabe, Gabe is one of those people for me, right? Like we can, we can tag team, um, each other and just, it, it helps to know like we're on different coasts. I'm not, you know, <laughs> I can't actually physically do anything to support this person. Um, but just knowing that there's somebody out there that's like, I see you, I got you you can do this, um, be that person for someone else and raise the hand when, when you need that help, um, goes a long way. Yeah. That's, that's great advice. I think, um, <clears throat> safety, safety people are usually the ones who say yes, who want to help others, Right. but it's okay to accept <clears throat> help <clears throat> in, re in return. Yeah. It's good. It's good that. to accept help. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure. Um, I know, we, like I said, we were uh, super excited when you agreed to come on with us and we were very much looking forward to today. So, uh, so thank you, Allison. Yeah, Absolutely. thanks so much, Allison. I appreciate it.